So what this means is because human beings have, there, there's never been a system anywhere in the world where human beings practice both waking up and growing up. It means that humanity has, for its entire history, has intentionally practiced uh, being broken. And we really haven't found any system that unites both of those and therefore can actually give us something that would appear to resemble um, the highest potential capacity human beings can reach. Collective Insights is a voyage through topics and technologies revolutionizing human well-being. Groundbreaking approaches for a better world and a better life await you. Welcome to Collective Insights. This is James Schmachtenberger, CEO and co-founder of Qualia. I appreciate your support of our podcast, Collective Insights, and I encourage you to try the formula that launched our company, Qualia Mind. Qualia Mind promotes life-changing enhancements to your focus, energy, and overall mental wellness. This podcast interviews world-renowned experts on crucial aspects of mental wellness, such as sleep, exercise, and mindset training. But if you also want to add the life-changing brain nourishment to your diet, try Qualia Mind at neurohacker.com. You can use code James for an extra 15% off. That's Qualia Mind with code James at neurohacker.com, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, welcome everybody to the Neurohacker Collective podcast, Collective Insights. My name is Daniel Schmachtenberger. I'm with research and development here at the Collective. I have just a uh, part of a voice here today, so forgive that. But uh, uh, hopefully I won't actually be doing much talking today. Really, really um, honored and delighted to have uh, Ken Wilbur with us on the podcast today. Ken is the founder of the Integral Institute and the system of philosophy known as uh, Integral Philosophy, one of the most published uh, American philosophers and translated into many languages. Um, He wrote uh, the Cosmos Trilogy, which is one of the deepest bodies of work on integrating thought across many, many traditions regarding the foundational nature of reality, how we go about knowing and how that's applied to the development of human experience and being human. The integral model is a model that's put forth as a way of knowing that all of the epistemologies, all the perspectives that need to be taken to fully understand something are taken and integrated appropriately. And that can be applied to and has been applied to ecology, government, medicine, lots of topics. Uh, As Ken was getting into this work, there was a deep background he had in medicine doing pre-med and biochem as well as studying the nature of consciousness and then the intersection across the hard problem. So as we're going to get to dive in here today to the future of both the uh, mind and brain and the relationship between them, um, this is a, you know area that Ken has been pioneering uh, very deeply, profoundly for a long time. Ken, thank you for being here with us today. My pleasure, Daniel. So we'll just dive right in and say when you vision the future of a comprehensive human flourishing system that gets to be, you know, appropriately generalized to things that are true for everyone and appropriately personalized and addresses physiology, psychology, et cetera. Can you just describe to us what, what you see that replaces what we call medicine and psychology and et cetera now as a human thriving system? Yeah. Well, what's so astonishing about that whole general area is how much knowledge we actually have right now um, versus how much of that knowledge is generally available to most people, or even for that matter, generally available to most college professors. Striking things that I've found as I sort of began my career of, of kind of trying to put a whole lot of different knowledge areas together um, is how rarely all of the different types of knowledge that I was looking at, how rarely it was all acknowledged and all actually um, utilized. It's actually shocking. Um, So one of the things that, that I would do, for example, is look at ways that human beings over the centuries, over the years up to today, 
have developed in order for what you might call self-improvement. And um, this can include, to use that term in a very broad sense, can include everything from psychotherapy um, to uh, various forms of uh, self-improvement uh, uh, programs to something like a, a great meditation tradition or contemplative tradition where you're trying to find your true self or higher uh, uh, awareness, higher consciousness, higher potential. Um, and if, if you look sort of uh, over the, the world at large, uh, you can find that there are, depending on exactly how narrowly you define self-improvement, you can find anywhere from sort of two major groups, two major different types that tend to show up, and then within those types, there's another anywhere from, from six to eight or so subtypes. I'll give you the two broad types uh, generally, because you can see the problem just w working with those. Um, we call these two types waking up and growing up. Waking up has to do with general practices of things like meditation, contemplation, centering prayer, um, Paths that humans have had a fairly good understanding of for at least a couple thousand years. And some versions of, of these interior paths of growth, these paths of meditation or contemplation or shamanic voyaging or yoga, go back possibly 20, 30,000 years. Um, if you take all of the really sophisticated meditation systems worldwide. And these include the, everything from uh, uh, practices like Zen Buddhism to Vedanta Hinduism to Taoism, Tibetan Buddhism, mm -hmm. over to Sufism in, in Islam, um, various forms of Christian mysticism, Kabbalah, Hasidim in, in Judaism. And uh, you take the actual meditative practices uh, of, of all of those great meditative system. You put them all on the table and you look at them, you start to see certain family resemblances to the stages that they outline that a typical human being who starts out um, with a sense of, of being identified with what Alan Watts called uh, a skin encapsulated ego. It's, it's just me, just myself, just this individual body. And there are several stages of expanding your identity that happens in a first-person subjective space. And it ends up with what the Sufis call the supreme identity. And this is a sense that your fundamental being, your absolutely real reality, is one with the ground of all being. And it's called a supreme identity. It's an identity with supreme uh, ultimate spirit as well. Now, as I say, if you take all of the great meditative systems, put them all on the table, look at the stages they describe that the human being in their own school goes through as they move from a very narrow, separate self-sense through expanded states of consciousness all the way up to an identity with the ground of all being and a sense of unity with the entire universe. And you look at those stages as I say, you find a certain family resemblance, a certain similarity among those stages. There are some important differences, but there are also some, some general similarities. And some people that have actually studied this fairly carefully, one of them, for example, is um, a colleague and in a sense a teacher for both Dustin DePerna and I, and his name is Daniel P. Brown. His work shows, for example, um, five or so major stages of this process that we call waking up. Um, one of the things that they all have in, in common is the belief that this small, narrow, separate self-sense is not our real self. We have deeper, broader, truer identities. And part of the human condition is that we're generally born in what the Christians would call original sin or what the Buddhists would call dukkha, inherent suffering. And the whole point is to get out of that prison of suffering, 
of, of separation, of illusion, and awaken, in the sense of waking up, um, to these deeper and truer realities. And so uh, Dan Brown is found in several traditions, uh, including um, the, uh, um, the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, um, various forms of Tibetan Buddhism, uh, Mahamudra and Dzogchen, um, the Theravada Buddhist uh, tradition, and he's also looked at a couple of Western traditions. Um, but he's found a similar set of, of these stages of, of waking up. And so those turn out to be, and in my own um, work, uh, that was separate from Daniel Brown's, I had also come up with around five major stages of waking up. Um, again, some traditions have more, some of them have what are clearly sub stages of the broader stages, um, but they're essentially recognizable um, for at least the past couple thousand years. Um, that's a very clear developmental unfolding sequence. But that's extremely different from what the modern West has come up with as it has looked at human development. So what the modern West has come up with is what we call growing up. And that's because this doesn't work with taking identity and expanding it to ultimate supreme Godhead status or uh, radical spiritual identity. This just takes a separate self-sense, which the traditions would look at as a fallen self, as an illusory self. Nonetheless, it has relative reality. It, it is there. Um, and they track the stages that this relative individual self goes through from the time it's born until it gets to at least the highest stages that developmental psychologists have found have evolved so far. And this started, this is relatively recent, where the waking of stages go back, we said it several thousand years. These growing up stages weren't really discovered until about 100, 150 years ago. And, but um, there are uh, probably a couple dozen major models of, of this individual self-development. And uh, again, if you put them all on a table and look at them all together, you can see some very broad similarities in the stages that they have proposed that human beings uh, go through. As they grow up in, 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 as a relative finite conventional individual self. Um, and if you look at these, um, some of the models, they, they basically have around six to eight major stages of growth and development. Um, it's clearly, these are clearly important stages, though, because um, you can look at them. Um, well, let me briefly footnote it by saying it looks like we don't just have, you know, one single intelligence, which is measured by IQ. Um, people like Howard Gardner and, and uh, several developmental psychologists believe that we have multiple intelligences and some think that there might be up to uh, um, even around a dozen of them. They include things like cognitive intelligence, emotional intelligence, moral intelligence, mathematical, musical intelligence. But all of those individual lines of development or multiple intelligences, they all grow or develop through a series of stages of development. And again, there are different models on what those are, and there's some fairly uh, heated theoretical arguments about who's right and who isn't. Um, but again, there's a broad similarity. And if you look at, for example, just um, to reduce it to very simplified form, just so people can get a sense about um, what's happening, uh, if you look at self-identity, we find that um, there are at least sort of four major stages that that goes through. Um, the earliest is called egocentric, 
Uh, it's what Carol Gilligan calls selfish. Uh, the next major stage, uh, what Gilligan called care, because the individual extends care from themself, themselves to a group. And then we also call that ethnocentric. The individual's identity expands to a whole group of individuals. And then uh, the third stage, Gilligan called universal care, and we call world-centric. It's an expansion from just a particular tribe, clan, nation, group, religion, to an identity with all of humanity. Um, and then her highest stage she called integrated, and, and it's a variation of what we call integral stages of development. And those tend to just um, uh, it tend to integrate or unify all of the uh, previous stages. Um, now, again, there are um, variations on, on those stages. If you look at Gebser's uh, worldview stages, for example, he has archaic to magic to mythic to rational, pluralistic, and integral. And those are all archaic is and, and magic are egocentric. Mythic is ethnocentric. Uh, rational and uh, pluralistic are world-centric, and integral is, is, is integral. So again, you can see um, a fair number of similarities there. Now, the point about mentioning these, these two major types of growth and development, one waking up and one growing up, is that there literally isn't a, a major system anywhere in the world, east or west, that's included both of those. Now, and that's, that's really kind of shocking um, because on the one hand, you have essentially the only type of process, developmental process, growth process, that humans have ever found that the ones that do it claim fairly unanimously that this is an access to ultimate truth. It's actually showing you an, a, an ultimate ground of all being. And you know that by directly experiencing it yourself. It's a direct immediate apprehension. It's not a dogma. It's not a belief. It's not a myth. Um, it's experienced in a peak or plateau experience in a first person uh, experiential fashion. And this can be checked and tested with entire groups of people that are, that are undergoing that developmental process. The traditions themselves have maintained that this is a pathway to ultimate truth. There's also relative truth. And although the traditions are not really aware of Western developmental psychology of growing up, they would say that those are stages in relative truth. Um, but they're clearly important because one of the things that we find is that these two developmental processes are relatively independent. In other words, you can be pretty high in one and quite low in the other or vice versa. And this is really problematic because on the one hand, if you have somebody who's gone very deeply into waking up and they have this experience of supreme identity, and yet they're, in terms of their actual relative development, where their mind is, how they're interpreting their experience, the tools that they have, if they're at an ethnocentric stage of development, then they're going to believe that their experience of supreme spirit then in order to have that experience you have to believe in their particular path and this is very common with uh, individuals who for example are fundamentalists and have a peak experience of, of supreme identity uh, if you're a christian for example and you do that then you'll believe that in order to have that experience of unity divine ultimate consciousness you have to believe in jesus christ as your personal savior and if you don't, then you can't have that experience. You might think you're having that experience, but you're really not. Now, so there's the problem. Virtually all of the major Western developmental psychologists that have studied these stages of development of the individual self, they're not aware of, or they give almost no credence to, any of the waking up stages of development. You don't find it in any of their models. Um, with a, some of them could sort of see that because this developmental process of growing up was increasing 
a person's identity, that they would just sort of say, well, we haven't found any examples, but let's say it could go a lot higher than Maslow, for example, beyond self-actualization needs, he postulated self-transcendence needs. Um, Holberg postulated beyond his sixth stage of, of uh, universal moral reasoning was a seventh stage that he called uh, mystical. But aside from little rare examples like that, and they have no theories about that, they have no practices going with that, and the vast majority of Western developmental models have no understanding of waking up at all. They're completely unaware of it. What this means is because human beings have, there, there's never been a system anywhere in the world where human beings practice both waking up and growing up. It means that humanity has, for its entire history, has intentionally practiced uh, being broken. And we really haven't found any system that unites both of those and therefore can actually give us something that would appear to resemble um, the highest potential capacity that human beings can reach. Now, of course, there can be higher stages down the line. There's abundant evidence that all of these have evolved. Um, and certainly, if you go back prior to humans, um, they, they've all evolved. Um, but that's just one example of what integral approaches do. Mm -hmm. so they look at all of these different areas, and waking up and growing up are two. We also have things we call cleaning up, uh, showing up, opening up, and so on. And they're all dealing with both sort of objective accounts of what reality looks like according to those specific viewpoints and perspectives, and then what human beings can do in order to grow and develop into the broadest possible comprehension they can of all of those various dimensions that each of these areas deal with. And again, what's so alarming about this is the, the evidence for the reality of, of each of these areas is, is really stunning. That, I mean, if you, again, if you put together all of the traditions that have some version of enlightenment or awakening or satori, it's, it's, they're everywhere. Um, if you look at the studies of developmental psychology of growing up, some of those models have been tested in over 40 different cultures, and they keep, they have evidence for them showing up time and time again. And yet nobody's ever put them together. And, and, and that's horrifying, because what you really want to be, I mean, you can be, you know, a world-centric, integrated individual self, completely unaware of ultimate reality. So you're living in a world of illusion. And yet you can also have this experience of having a kind of awakening or waking up experience to an ultimate reality. And yet you can still be identified, you can still be ethnocentric or even egocentrically identified. In other words, you're an enlightened Nazi. So this isn't good. Um, so, so that's just part, that's been part of the situation that struck me the most uh, in my own career when I started out um, sort of intentionally um, with a question not of all these various systems that are out there, um, not which one is right, which ones are all wrong, but how can they all fit together? How can they all be right? Because the fact is all of them exist. They have some sort of evidence that human beings wouldn't adopt them. It doesn't mean everything they say is right, but there's some fundamental phenomena that they're dealing with that are real. Because the human brain doesn't react to just pure uh, uh, illusion, pure unreality. So there's something real going on. And the integral approach or integral meta theory simply uh, attempts to put as many of those together as possible. And we do have an emphasis on what you can do to help your own first person consciousness grow and develop so it can embrace and encompass the dimensions that all of these other areas are pointing to or dealing with. So I want to just underline something for the listeners that is um, really important and kind of underrepresented in uh, modern scientific framework. And what Ken is saying is he's saying that he had an intuition that all homo sapiens that had genetically identical brains for us for a very long time, weren't completely stupid before Newton, before what we call the, uh, you know, advent of the modern scientific method. And so it's not that all of knowledge 
and human inquiry and exploration up until the point that we figured out the scientific method was completely just gibberish. Now, that doesn't mean it was all completely correct, just like we are continuously error correcting science and what Asimov called the ever writing of wrong. But if we if we acknowledge that there have been humans that were had genetically identical brains to us that had time allocated to really thinking about things deeply for a long time, that we might want to see if there were some valuable insights and that if some of the ideas proliferated, that there's at least partial truth worth looking at. Right. That's one kind of idea. And then the next one is core to the idea of what we consider science is the ability to uh, independently verify measurement and then independently verify, uh, you know, the abstractions on the measurement, the scientific inquiry, right. Uh, right. insights we come up with. It's tricky to do that when it comes to subjectivity, but it's not impossible. And so if we're trying to explore the nature of consciousness and experience, we do have to deal with things like subjective reporting bias and all kinds of internal cognitive and emotional and existential biases. Right. But it doesn't mean that there isn't something like a formalism for how to explore the domain of subjectivity. So you hear right. it and continue to say when we put them all on the table, right. meaning if people across different regions that couldn't have been influencing each other came up with things that were similar or different, the differences allow for error correction, the similarities for corroboration, Right. start to explore something formally. So <clears throat> do you want to speak more about that, Ken, kind of well, yeah, subject-subject I mean, subject relationship? Uh, one mm. of the things that um, that had a, a big impact on me is starting out looking at all this stuff. I mean, as you pointed out, I went through medicine and, and Western science and so on. Um, and, and, and all of that was great. Um, and then uh, the 60s hit. I'm a, a sort of a classic boomer. Um, and there's this influx of Eastern traditions. And it started with things like Zen Buddhism um, and a, a scholar called D.T. Suzuki, um, who wrote a series of books, including a three volume set called Essays in Zen Buddhism. And all of a sudden, there was this notion of something called Satori. And this was an experience of this unitive ex experiential oneness, this awakening to your supreme identity this uh, sense of oneness with the ground of all being and oneness with the entire universe uh, as, as your fundamental reality. And that was something that you didn't get in Sunday school. I, I, we just never heard of this kind of stuff. Um, and it made a pretty big impact. Uh, Lynn White, a uh, fairly reputable historian, said that the translation of Suzuki's essays in Zen Buddhism into English will historically rank with the translation of the Bible in, in, into English. Um, it really had a, a, an impact and it shook a lot of us up. And it really shook me up because um, I had, I was raised a Southern Baptist and as soon as I hit adolescence and formal operational cognition emerged and I went science and threw over all of that religious uh, silliness. Um, and so it turns out, though, that there's religion and then there's religion. Um, and, and there's at least two very different types of things that have been called religion in humankind's history. Um, one of them is a, a, a occurs in the waking up dimension and one occurs in the growing up dimension. And, of course, both of these are, are operating to some degree. Uh, in most people. Um, waking up has to do with states of consciousness. These are first person direct experiential states of consciousness. And yet in growing up, what most developmental psychologists study aren't direct states. They're more the interpretive structures or uh, frameworks that human beings use um, when they activate intelligence in a particular line. And so these structures of consciousness are much more like, let's say, rules of grammar. Uh, anybody brought up in a particular language speaking culture ends up speaking that language fairly correctly. If it's subject and verb together correctly, they use adjectives and adverbs correctly. In other words, they're following large system of rules of grammar. But if you ask them to write down those rules of grammar that they're following, almost none of them can do it. Most of them don't even really realize they're following rules of interpretation when they speak or, or think. Um, and these, these stages of 
of growing up are, are very much like stages of kinds of grammar, kind of worldview grammars. Um, and so whether you're looking at Kurt Fisher's uh, sensory motor to representation, to abstraction, to systems or principles, or if you're looking at the simplified egocentric, the ethnocentric, the world-centric, the integral, these are all, a person at those stages has no idea that they're at those stages um, because you can't see these structures of consciousness by introspecting. Just like if you introspect now, you can't see the rules of grammar, both following them. So, um, and this, this goes up to even the more complex developmental models like Gebser's archaic, magic, mythic, rational, pluralistic. Um, if you look at, to use Gebser's, archaic to magic, to mythic, to rational, to pluralistic, to integral, many of the foundational texts of the world's great religions that were written during the axial period some 2,000 years ago, that happened to be a general era that, that most um, especially emphasized the mythic stage of growing up. That's where a lot of humanity was at that time. That's where a lot of the uh, early productions and human uh, thought systems were driven by. And so you have something like the Old Testament, where Moses parting the Red Sea and Lot's wife is turned into a pillar of salt. And uh, these are all very mythic, mythological types of frameworks. Um, many of them can be produced by a seven-year-old child today. Um, many of the fundamentalist religious texts around the world are either magic or mythic. It, it, we actually have empirical studies on this. One of the best known is by James Fowler. And he looked at um, individuals going through their uh, religious belief development. And again, he found about six major stages of development that human beings go through when they think about an ultimate reality or in his version, an ultimate concern. And he actually called the mythic stage the mythic literal, because that tends to be how that stage thinks. And so if you have a fundamentalist, um, even if they cognitively have gone on and they're at sort of a rational stage of, of development, their belief system, uh, particularly if they believe the Bible is the word of God, um, then it's focused on something that was actually written during a mythic literal time. <clears throat> so so they, they tend to keep their spiritual intelligence at this mythic literal level. But there's another type of religious engagement, and that comes from the waking up side of the street. And that's, again, that's something that now we're dealing with first person states of consciousness. So when you're going through the stages of waking up, and you get to, let's say, what's uh, sometimes called a causal or a, a formless uh, dimension of awareness, and you have an experience of being absorbed in this vast, infinite abyss that's um, flooded with infinite love and luminosity. Well, you know it. It's not like grammar and you don't, you're operating on it and you have no idea you are. When you have that experience of being one in universal love and bliss, you are directly aware of it. You, you know exactly what's going on. So that gives a kind of spiritual experience but that's very different than, than the simple interpretive worldview type of, ex of, of experience. And what we tend to find as we look around the world at the great religious traditions is that there really are two fundamentally different types of, of spiritual systems. And they're often actually called esoteric and exoteric. And exoteric is a simple belief that you can have. And that's usually magic or mythic literal belief. And you learn it, you and you pledge allegiance to it. You say, "Yes, I, you know, I have the one and only God and His or Her one and only Prophet or whatever it is," um, and that's fine. But then there's the esoteric, the hidden or inner teachers of of, of uh, religion, and that involves a series of practices of in looking into this interior subjectivity and in a sense just resting deeper and deeper and deeper uh and as that happens you tend to go through these 
uh, what are held to be more real and more real and more real states of consciousness or dimensions of existence. And the, the five that I mentioned Daniel Brown uses and the five that I had uh, come upon, we actually see explicit, and this is actually all going towards the science of, of consciousness. Um, there are actually several uh, meditative schools that explicitly give those five major states of consciousness. Um, we explicitly find this in Vedanta. We find it in Tibetan Buddhism, Vajrayana, and we find it in a few Neoplatonic schools in the West. And those five states are, in the Vedanta version, they're called gross, subtle, causal, turiya, and turiyatita. Now, uh, an example of a gross state is just uh, awareness of the physical realm, and so the, the classic <clears throat> example of Vedanta gives a common example of a gross state is just the ordinary egoic waking state. Just if you're just sitting here looking at physical reality and, and you're, you, know, you exist in this body and that's it, uh, that's a typical gross state. An example of a subtle state that's usually given is the dream state. And that's because in the dream state, there's no longer a physical world. You're not, guy is gone, trees are gone, mountains are gone. There's just images, light, um, various uh, sorts of energetic currents, uh, feelings, and so on. Um, and this is all held to be um, productions of, of the mind operating in, in a subtle state. Um, the causal state is taken to be that moment to moment as the universe is emerging, is manifesting out of an ultimate spirit or ultimate reality, it first gives rise to the first forms of manifestation themselves. And these are what the Greeks called archetypes, archetype, primordial form. It's the first forms of awareness. And those are said to be the forms upon which all other forms depend. Um, so for Plato, they're the forms. Uh, Whitehead, Whitehead would include things like uh, color. Um, some include, uh, see them as sort of geometric forms. Um, but it's, it's just part of this constant stream that virtually all of the traditions see of this involutionary outpouring of spirit that creates the world moment to moment right now. And then spirit loses itself in each of those states. And then when it comes all the way down to the lowest state, which is the material physical state, it then turns around and starts the return trip in consciousness. And that creates uh, a, a, a very common model is generally called the great chain uh, of the uh, Christian version of that is body to mind to soul to spirit. And those are the five major states. Um, and so the beyond causal is something called Turiya. And Turiya is simply a Sanskrit term that literally means the fourth. And it got named because it's the fourth major state of consciousness after the first three. Not a very imaginative way to name it, but that's what it is. And that's just pure awareness, not any object of awareness. So it's sometimes called the witness. It's that in you right now, which is aware of everything that's arising. And if you get a sense of your own individual self, you'll notice that you're aware of that. And that means that you're, what you normally call yourself isn't your real self. It's just an object of awareness. That awareness is your real self. That awareness, the witness, um, is maintained to be a pure manifestation of spirit itself. And that's why virtually all of the great traditions maintain that human beings have at least two selves. They have the relative self that can be seen as an object or known as an object. And then there's the seer itself that's doing the seeing. And that can't be seen any more than an eye could see itself or a tongue could taste itself. It's just that pure purusha or atman that is one with Brahman. And that's your true self. And then Tiryatita, which literally means beyond the fourth, is you're sitting there and you have this sense of pure witness that is free of all manifestation because it's, itself is just a pure absolute subjectivity that actually transcends subject and object. Um, but it's, it's, um, it's a vast formless 
empty, unmanifest, infinite reality. Your true self. And then that's simply standing back is said to be nete, nete. It's not this, it's not that. So I have sensations, but I'm not those sensations. I have feelings, but I'm not those feelings. I have thoughts, but I'm not those thoughts. I'm the pure witness of all of that. On the fifth state, that witness itself merges with everything that's witnessed, and we get a pure, non dual, unitary, ultimate oneness. <clears throat> reality. Okay. So that's a, a long introduction to saying that both of these two types of religious um, occasions, spiritual occasions, have very, very different types of truth associated with them. Very, very types, very different types of reality that are associated with them. Um, one of them is coming from a relatively low stage of growing up. The other is coming from the highest stage of waking up. And these, these are night and day. This, what's interesting is how individuals arrived at these stages of waking up, and particularly the higher stages. Because here we find that they actually have a methodology that's very, very similar to science. And in this sense, if, you, if we look at um, some of the, the crucial elements of, of, of modern science, um, we, we find that there are generally at least three major components to knowledge that we tend to take as, as, as scientifically true or real. Um, the first is an injunction or um, some sort of methodology. It, it's generally of the form, um, if you want to know this, do this. So if you want to know if it's raining outside, go to the window and look. If you want to know if a cell has a nucleus, invent a microscope, cut, cut a cell, section a cell, stain it, look. Um, if you want to know if, if Jupiter has nine moons, uh, invent a telescope and look. So, so, so there's a certain kind of, well, what Kuhn called an exemplar uh, paradigm, a, a certain action that is generally felt to be necessary, even mathematics, draw two parallel lines, that kind of thing. Once you do that, you will have, generally speaking, um, a direct experience or a data or an illumination will occur. Um, so you're looking down the microscope, then you're going to get data. You can have a, an actual experience of, of, of the reality that that injunction has introduced you to. And so that is this data or illumination or direct experience is, uh, is crucial to science because it's generally what they call evidence. So this isn't coming from just a thought or dogma or a belief system. It's, it's an actual direct evidential uh, illumination. And then once you've done that, maybe you've gone to the window, that's your injunction, and then you've looked, and you, if it's raining, actually, you see the rain. That's your data. That's your illumination, your experience. But you could be hallucinating or goofy or something, so you ask somebody else to come to the window and look with you. And that's the third strand. It's either a confirmation or a rejection. Some people put it uh, in strong terms and maintain that it's a fallibility principle. Um, more generically, it's simply a group experiential repetition of people that have done your injunction, had a data, and then compared results. Now, that's actually, those three steps are exactly what every one of the major spiritual contemplative traditions does. So if you take something like Zen Buddhism, that, that's not a belief system. You're not meant to memorize you know, a metaphysics or let alone a mythic system. Um, you are, first of all, given a series of injunctions on things that you need to do with your mind if you're going to get access to this data. And that includes uh, a couple of different types of meditation. All of them have the net effect of having awareness disidentify from the objects of awareness. So mindfulness itself is just a direct objectification of everything that's arising. You just see it all as an object. 
uh, I'm aware of this, I'm aware of that, I'm mindful of this, I'm mindful of that. That's just converting all of these things that really are just objects, um, and you're disidentified with them. So you're, you're falling more and more in just the witness, the pure witness. And if you continue doing that, and there might be um, certain added exercises that go along with that, but various injunctions are, are brought forth. In other words, actual methodologies, things you actually have to do. And then that will bring you to the second step, which is an actual illumination, a data. In Zen, it's called Satori or Kensho. And that's when you directly have this immediate experience of your real self, or even deeper, an experience of this unity with everything. The Tibetans call that one taste. So either one of those will constitute a Satori, or it's also called a Kensho, which means seeing your true nature. Um, and then you have to check that with the community of people that have done the injunction and had the data, and then you compare your data with theirs. And uh, for the most part, your data should agree with what's already been done, because these injunctions have been done in most instances, decades, centuries, even millennia. And so the same way if, if you're looking at the structure of water, you're probably going to find that it's H2O. If you find something different, you really better check it with other people. Um, so so the, the, these three strands are what we find in virtually every contemplative tradition. So it really is a, a, a series of um, epistemological verification procedures. And that seems to be one of the reasons that we do find these broad family similarities in, in most of the great uh, meditative uh, traditions. And that's why Dan Brown can find these, you know, five major stages and, and so on. And so if, if nothing else, these traditions um, give us a very good indication of at least one way to do a type of methodology that can be repeated. And that most importantly, shows that it's not just private. I mean, you can't train these things and just get a private experience. That's the whole point of this kind of training is that you're making it public. It's a public communicative exchange. Uh, and that's why there's, that's why this knowledge can be passed on. Uh, Zen Buddhism is said to, you know, go all the way back to Gautama Buddha. It probably didn't, but the point is it certainly went back to Bodhidharma uh, and has been passed forward for 1500 years. Um, so there's a consistency to that. Um, and, and given the similarities both of the human brain among humans and the traditions would say given the similarities in, in the actual ontological structure of the cosmos um, then individuals who follow these particular type of injunctions have that particular type of data compare it with a community of knowers um, there's going to be a broad similarity that we're going to find around the world in that and and that does indeed the case so that's crucially important um, because this, again, you're not asking anything in terms of mere belief, let alone myths or dogma or anything like that. And that's why these traditions um, are always separated from the exoteric ones, which rely on just mere belief or myths or um, fairy tales, frankly. So that so makes it very interesting. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to try and go into this as far as we could go, because it's a deep rabbit hole. But most of the people listening on this podcast have some background in scientific epistemology and probably not in other types of epistemology. Right. And so then there's some obvious questions that come up and let's just address the kind of most obvious ones. So if someone's doing an injunction that is a subjective injunction, right. do this Buddhist practice and you'll have this experience and they've already heard ahead of time, you'll have this experience. Right. You have a confirmation bias that subjectivity is particularly sensitive to right. and you have no falsifiability, meaning if someone doesn't have it, they're just not enlightened enough yet and they keep trying until they have it. So how, how do you address the, this is something like a formalism with those issues of non falsifiability and confirmation bias? Right. Well, one of the ways that, um, that, that, that we do this in science um, is after, after getting a particular result with one methodology, we'll, uh, we'll also see if we can't get similar results uh, looking at it from different methodologies. Um, and 
the same thing has happened with, with these spiritual peak experiences because there are several different types of injunctions that end up um, apparently opening to the same degree on, onto these dimensions uh, of awareness. And so we get similar types of reports. And this also happens in some cases, uh, for example, just common uh, everyday peak experiences. The most recent poll I saw showed that about 60% of Americans have had some sort of spontaneous peak experience where they felt one with the entire universe and often in a sense of love and great peace of mind, and stuff like that. So in other words, they're having a Satori uh, experience. Um, there's also uh, psychedelics, which we get some very similar kinds of experiences. And there's also the, the worldwide uh, feedback on mm. near-death experiences, which are also very, very similar to these things. So there appears to be some actual grounding in some of the structures of reality, or at least dimensions of, of human awareness and human brainstorm, such that we can get similar results with several different types of injunctions or methods. And that just increases the, uh, the believability in what these things uh, are doing. Okay, so you've been talking about the relationship between the waking up traditions and the growing up traditions. I want to talk about another um, interesting and, and maybe even trickier um, dual relationship, which is the subject-object relationship. So yep. specifically here, mind-brain. Yep. So you mentioned psychedelics, and that takes us right there. So we can induce brain states chemically or with transcranial magnetic stimulation or whatever right. and produce subjective changes pretty reliably. We can also do things phenomenologically with our consciousness that change what we see showing up on a QEEG. Yeah. So it's, of course, um, it's not surprising that – since the ontologic categories of subjectivity and objectivity are so different and they're clearly related somehow that when we have an epistemology, we have a method of studying the objective and we see that they're correlated. We end up collapsing the subjective to being an emergent property of the objective mind emerges from neural networks and from, from neural networks, right? Uh, but, yes and no. I'm, I'm saying it's pretty easy for, if I have a scientific method that can study the objective to say, if there's something other than objective that correlates with objective, it's an emergent property of. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, just to complete this so that you can speak to the whole thing. It's also somewhat easy. If you have a method that studies the subjective to say all of objectivity is either Maya or is arising as a structure of consciousness. So either side can kind of collapse the right hand quadrants to an emergent phenomena of the left or vice versa. Yep. So getting into why tetra arising right really fundamental co-arising is an important thing right what the basis for that is right and specifically the mind brain interface of where right. we can address the psychopharmacology of brains and bodies right. and affect consciousness and the consciousness that can then affect both consciousness and health right Speak to that for us please right. well um uh one of the things um that that mm. we do um with, with, with integral meta theory and the way that we look at the quadrants anyway is essentially to say that, that these four quadrants are uh, four different dimensions of uh, a single happenstance, a single occurrence. Uh, and if we just look at the upper left and, 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 and upper right, although there's, depending on how you define a consciousness, there's, there's a subject and object in both of those. But, but most commonly, um, subjective domain is taken to be the interior of the individual, the upper left. And objective is, is uh, taken to be the exterior, the upper right. Um, if you go all the way back um, to a billion or two years after the after the Big Bang, and 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 then you work with something like uh, Alfred um, Whitehead's um, philosophical description of moment to moment uh, existence and what's happening, um, I, I like Whitehead because he doesn't uh, attempt to. Uh, derive subject from object or object from subject, but tends to see them arising, co-arising. 
um, although they, they interact in, in very um, influential ways. Um, but a moment comes to be as a subject of experience. And, and so it's got a little bit of proto-feeling or proto-awareness or proto-consciousness, um, whatever that interior, um, why did I call it prehension? Or whatever that prehension is, and and while that's arising, then then, then that subject will prehend the previous subject, making it object, um, and then it will add its own degree of novelty. So what we're really getting is each moment both transcends because it adds a degree of novelty, and it includes because it prehends the previous moment. So subject and object are interwoven in this moment to moment, transcend and include fashion. And if you track those, if you go ahead and track the interior uh, of that atom and the exterior of that atom, then what you see throughout the ages is you, is you come upon life forms. And then so, it, well, the first uh, life form we have um, atoms coming together as molecules and molecules coming together is the first cells. So if we, if we stop at cells, there, there's still cellular now prehension, and that's the interior proto-feeling, uh, proto-subjective uh, aspect of, of that moment. Um, and, and then the, the object is, is anything you can see uh, about a cell by looking at a microscope, for example. So that's the matter-energy uh, component of it. And as those are going to just continue evolving, then we're going to arrive where we have a human body with a triune brain, and those are all exteriors. And on the interior, we have the whole prehensive unifications at every major evolutionary stage of development. And that includes going all the way back to there's, uh, there are atoms, and then there's an atomic prehension, and those are in molecules or the molecular, those are in cells with a cellular prehension, and then those are in multicellular organisms, and those go through fish into reptiles into mammals, and then we have a human, a human body. And that human body has holons going all the way back to Big Bang. It has quarks, it has atoms, it has molecules, it has cells up the tree of life. Um, and so, so and, then, and then when you get to the first human beings themselves, um, 50,000 years ago, they start out using Gepser stages. Again, they start out in an archaic stage. Then about 50,000 years ago, the magic stage emerged. And then around uh, 5,000 years or so ago, mythic stage emerged. And then the rational stage. So we get up to rational stage here on the upper left, on the interior subjective consciousness component. And then corresponding with that in the upper right is a triune brain with all the exterior matter, energy, physiological complexity, and so on that that has. And these have co-arisen together all the way back to the Big Bang. And, and if uh, you don't mind, I just want to interject yeah. one thing so the listeners follow it who are new to your work. I want everyone to get that the idea of something like a panpsychism, that there is consciousness or something like consciousness, protoqualia at various levels. Um, you notice that all of the levels that Ken described, and he said, hold on, are self-organizing systems in universe. So he didn't say there's something that it's like to be your car or a salt shaker, right. which is a complicated non-self-organizing system. When you look at the self-organization of atoms or molecules or cells, the idea that there is a self other than self distinction from a self organizing boundary that occurs with the internal and external forces that make that boundary is a is a radically clearer way of thinking of panpsychism than anything that you can identify at all, even if non self organizing has a protoqualia. So yeah. it is it's a, just an important thing to make sure um, yeah. you get so. And I, I mean, I'm not, um, I've never even been comfortable, let's say, with, uh, with Whitehead's uh, presentation of prehension, um, because it's, it seems like he's putting just a little bit too complex 
subjective realities into an extremely simplified form. And so it's not quite enough. So I've always thought, particularly at the lower stages of, of overall development, starting with quarks or even strings, quarks, uh, atoms, molecules, is that they, they certainly have uh, an exterior. I mean, that that's what every scientist in the world would maintain that they've got some sort of exterior. And I simply maintain, well, yeah, exteriors don't make any sense without interiors. I mean, they have to go together. So whatever the exterior is, it's got an interior. And I'm, I'm not a pan psychic. I'm a pan interiorist. Um, anything that's got an outside, it's got an inside, or it just doesn't make sense. It, it just has mm. no sense at all. And then you can put anything you want to in it, and for some people, they, they just not going to believe atoms have any sort of prehension at all. And so in those sort of worst cases, I'll say, fine. You can see the, the, the evolutionary sequences in, in all the quadrants. So wherever you're comfortable putting consciousness in, do it. Uh, presumably by shrimp or deer or apes. At some point, it pops in there. And, and the only important thing is don't collapse the, the quadrants. That's the disaster of trying to, to reduce mind to brain or brain to mind. That doesn't work. Um, and that's, that's the whole point about the four quadrants is that they are irreducible. And that's just, that's just a very simple but extremely important uh, rule of thumb that stops an enormous number of absolutely catastrophic uh, confusions. So at, at some point in a different podcast, for those who are interested, a very deep dive into prehension at the early levels of the hard problem in foundational ontology would be fun. Sure. <clears throat> but as we continue in what's going to be interesting and useful for most people. So there's a, there is a co-evolution of subject and object of upper left and upper right quadrants. Yeah. Now the question is, they, they both seem to be co-influencing. I don't want to say bi-directional causation because even causation is a particular type of influence. Right. Yep. And so, you know, if someone watched your video where you're doing some meditative thing and, and the neural correlates on the EEG are changing, Right. Or someone has taken psychedelics and they're like, it seems like consciousness is just a result of what I do to brain chemistry. Right. How do we how do we understand those things together? Um, this is this tends to be um, is something that um, I have run into a lot um, over the years, uh, mm. and, and it has to do. Um, not only with those quadrants, with literally all of those dimensions that, that I was mentioning uh, um, are areas that I have eventually found to be important and to be real and to have plenty of evidence for. Um, and this includes quadrants and levels of development, uh, lines of development, states of consciousness, um, various types and so on. Um, and it's very, very rare that a person will be persuaded by any type of facts or logic or argument to accept the reality mm. of these dimensions. It's, it's almost like they're native. I don't believe that. Um, but people tend to be mm. open to these things or they just, they, you just can't really seem to, to get them to come along. Um, and people tend to have very, very strong feelings about mind and brain. Um, and they're still, I mean, you look at the Journal of Consciousness Studies, and it, it's almost about half and half. Hmm. half it, it, all of consciousness is nothing but um, brain physiology. And others are no wait, you only know physiology through experience. Experience is primary, upper left is real. Um, and I, I just... Um, I, I, I just throw my hands up. I mean, I, I, it just, it, it, if any one of these arguments is really compelling, it would have won the day by now. Um, no side of this argument has ever won. And that's why the hard problem is still a hard problem, uh, except for uh, integral meta theory. You know, we haven't solved it, but it's not a problem for us because we simply take these to be mm -hmm. co-arising, tetra-arising, mm -hmm. correlative realities. And, and at the very least, both of them are equally real. Now, we can always find, you know, little ways that there are certain kinds of bi-directional causality occurring. There's also tetra-causality occurring. There's all sorts of things going on. 
Um, but what doesn't work is to reduce one to the mm. other without remainder. It, it's just, it's never worked. It never will. It's one never of my, worked. one of my favorite examples of just what you're mentioning right now is um, it really is kind of like the symbol grounding problem in AI. If you don't have, if the symbol doesn't have a multi dimensional intersecting sensory experience and right. it just doesn't ground you, you'd know the chemistry of the strawberry, but not what it tastes like and it's still not grounding. So you watch, <clears throat> You know, when obviously people like Sam Harris and Dan Dennett are on the same side of consciousness uh, or subjectivity emerging from brain, and yet Sam writes the book on free will, Dan gets writes the critique, they go back and forth, and Sam thinks consciousness is real, but free will isn't. Dan thinks free will is real, but consciousness isn't. And they're both coming from a post-popper um, philosophy of science that has the same epistemology and the same rules of critical thinking. And they're looking for the same logical fallacies. And at the very end of the argument, Sam says the smartest thing that he says in the whole time, which is apparently we just have different intuitions on this. And that's about it. And that was actually a really insightful thing to say is that yeah. the idea that this is a pure axiom data, logical conclusion process isn't actually true because the argument either lands as true or not based yeah. on its correlation with experience. And what's not completely clear um, is, is um, presumably there's some type of experience, um, experienced evidence um, that a person could have that would change their mind. And people do change their minds, and, and presumably it's for reasons. Um, so so um, I bring this up because it, it reminds me of another place that I see this all the time. Um, namely, people having beliefs that can't be altered by evidence or facts or argument. And that's with the uh, beliefs that are generated by the stages of, of growing up development themselves. So if you have somebody at magic or at mythic or at rational or at pluralistic, you take somebody at, a, at a, a mythic literal fundamentalist stage of development, they are convinced the Bible is literally true it's the word of god and you can say well how about things like um the fossil record and i'll go oh right the fossil record the lord created that on the fifth day and you go <laughs> no no you don't you don't understand <laughs> let me let me try it again but it just it's not going to happen and no amount of evidence no amount of fact no amount of argument because the interpretive grid through which they are seeing everything won't allow it to arise and and that it, I, it just reminds me when I see these kinds of arguments about the reality of the entire data. Um, it could be just a you know uh, uh, an honest uh, intellectual mistake. It's a conclusion they make, and they're just not quite thinking well. Or it could be there's some sort of experiential uh, occasion that's going to give them the type of data that will have them change their minds and i don't know exactly what that is um but i i i uh i keep hoping that we can find uh, so let's like that. let's not try and actually properly address the whole ontology of the mind brain interface here but let's address the part that everyone experiences as real which is if i've got someone who is in has some chronic physical pain or anxiety or depression or addiction there are psychotherapeutic processes that actually help there are physiotherapeutic processes that help and they don't help the same for everyone. So one of the things we talk about at Neurohacker is did someone's anxiety happen right after a black mold exposure? I'm probably not going to CBT it away. Um, if I've got excitotoxicity from certain mycotoxins, did it happen after a head injury? Did it happen after an acute PTSD like trauma? Had they always had it because of early childhood attachment dynamics so that and anyone's anxiety might be multifactorial result of lots of those things, some of which are largely psychological and even within that domain of different types, some physiological with a different types. So as we start to think about what is a system of human flourishing, and of course, if their environment still has mold, that's a lower quadrant phenomena. Or if they're around people that are lying to them all the time and they can feel it, so they're anxious as fuck because yeah. they don't know what's true, yep. it's a lower quadrant phenomena. Yep. So if, if someone comes and tells me they've got an anxiety disorder, I have to do an all quadrant assessment to even have a sense of where I'm going to start my processes. Yep. Um, so 
And that would be true for me with pretty much anything. If they say they have depression, I'm not going straight to they need to know their supreme self or straight to you have head trauma. I don't know. I would love if you would speak a little bit to, so now someone has an issue they want to get past or they have higher states and stages of both their own quality of experience and their capabilities they want to develop. How do we go about figuring out what is going to be most relevant for somebody yeah. across all the quadrants and how those parts come together to be able to help them? Yep. And this is, um, this is a crucial topic and it, it, it truly is based mm-hmm. on um, just how integral your, your overview is um, because um, my uh, understanding of all these various dimensions, quadrants and levels and lines and states and types, um, is that although there are very few knowledge communities that recognize the reality of all of those, Mm -hmm. um, they're all arising, it's all occurring moment to moment, they're all interwoven, they're all impacting each other, and if something's going wrong, then literally you have to do a, you know, an integral assessment of, of the whole shebang. And God knows that's not complete now. I mean, a hundred years from now, 500 years from now. Um, but we at least know that these various dimensions that, that we're talking about, I know there's substantial evidence for their existence. Um, we have plenty of examples of, of when people engage in these variables, alter them, that they have a very profound effect on the issues that they're trying to deal with. And so even if you look at something like you mentioned pain, and I talked earlier about the fact that waking mm-hmm. up is so poorly understood and, and so um, poorly accepted by um, a large number of uh, experts and authorities uh, in the West, um, but the capacity for certain meditative states to handle pain is staggering. Um, you can get into Turiya and follow consciousness to what appears to be its source. And then the only way that we can interpret that source right now is how it appears subjectively because we don't have any data from the other quadrants yet. We haven't, we don't, haven't yet done brain studies on this. But subjectively, it feels like you're literally at the source of creation of, of entire manifest universe. You actually have to, at, at a spiritual source of ultimate mm-hmm. reality. And if you, if you rest in that state, then the experience in consciousness is that phenomena will stop arising until they get to a, an actual state that Theravada Buddhism calls nirod. And nirod means cessation. And that's actually a synonym for nirvana. And, and this is the state that Gautama Buddha originally was recommending. And he claimed it put an yeah. end to all suffering, all pain, all desire, all uncomfort. Um, we had examples of the type of extreme pain that that state would stop during the Vietnam War. Yeah. When sev- several monks protesting the war would get into that position, get into that state, be completely doused in gasoline and set on fire. And right there on live TV in front of millions of people, they would burn to the ground and not flinch once. So I want everybody to go watch these videos and look at the pictures because since we don't have that experience, it's easy to just call bullshit. But then when you watch someone self-emoliate, and not flinch, which is real, not even grimace until the body's dead. It is. Recognize that there is something about consciousness that they're experiencing that is outside of our reference frame. Exactly. And so if, if you are undergoing um, a great deal of pain and you want to say, well, what are my options? If somebody doesn't tell you that that's a real option, they're mm. not being very confident in, in terms of giving you alternatives. Um, And then, of course, we have other things. We have biofeedback. We have various types of um, brain-mind machines. Uh, We have various sorts of, you know, um, chemicals, um, medical treatments for that. Um, And then, like you said, we also have to, uh, when we're looking for causes, we have to make sure that we're sweeping uh, the environment. Um, There's um, uh, even evidence that um, 
uh, uh, stress and disruption in a relationship or, or in your family cause enormous amount of uh, pain. And, and, and if it doesn't cause it, it can, it can exacerbate it and, and aggravate it enormously. So what we're getting as we take um, integral approaches to things are a much broader view of both the possible sources of the problem as well as the possible cures or some sort of fixes that we can take to help the problem along. And, and the only thing that's so surprising is that in, in, in virtually all the problems that we look at, the only thing that they all have in common is that, is that the, the most common solution that's taken to the problem is not integral. So it's not including things that would actually make it much better. Um, and, and then we have, in, in the cases that we do have, we have studies where actually a much more integral approach was taken and it works much better because it's taking many more variables into account. It's dealing with a lot more parameters that are actually impacting the problem. And so when you take mm -hmm. all those into account, you get much better results. Now and the so that's one of the things I just sort of look at the future and, mm -hmm. and you know, what's, what's uh, possible for, for humanity. Um, it's taking all uh, um, of these variables into account. And I'll give you just one real quick. Um, we talked about stages of growing up and how virtually all the multiple intelligences, no matter what model uh, of developmental psychology we use, um, most of them have a series of delineated stages that, that, that these multiple intelligences go through. The, many of the most common ones, Kurt Fisher, Piaget, deal with a cognitive line of, of development. And that's also um, related to the self-identity line that goes from egocentric, ethnocentric, world-centric, integral. Studies consistently show that between around 60 to 70 percent of the world's population is at ethnocentric or lower levels of development. Even Robert Keegan estimates using his particular subject object developmental model that three uh, out of five, 60 percent, don't make it to rational. In other words, they're ethnocentric, mythic, magic, or archaic. They're egocentric or ethnocentric. And then we look at the world's problems and, and, and we look at conflicts that human beings are having with other human beings. And we almost always say, okay, there's a technological fix or there's an economic fix or there's a military fix. What we don't do is look at any of the left-hand quadrants. We don't say, wait a minute, you can give people you know, all the money you want. And if they're still at an ethnocentric stage of development, they're not world-centric. Mm -hmm. There's going to be literal tribal animosity. This, the standard attitude of ethnocentric stages, by whatever name, is jihad. There's a fundamental religious belief about whatever it is, that religious Republicans or religious Democrats or religious feminists or religious Marxists, and, they, and, they'll, and, and they'll declare war on people that disagree with them. Um, Claire Graves used to call that stage absolutistic. Um, and that's the problem. If you have a bunch of warring tribal groups that have absolutistic beliefs, and they're, so they're at each other's throats, and you say, what can we do to stop that? And the one thing that you don't say is, oh, we have to work on interior development or nothing's ever going to change. That's the one thing we don't say. We say, oh, well, let's uh, militarily attack this one, or oh, let's economically help that one, or oh, let's use technological aid over here. Um, so uh, the whole point about, about these, these different variables is how really central a lot of them are. And the simple fact that there are just are very, very few systems that are even aware of, of all of those dimensions, let alone actually accept them and, and, and work with ways to incorporate them into actual solutions to real problems. Um, that's a very serious issue. And unfortunately, it's also an issue that almost nobody recognizes 
because integral uh, systems just aren't that uh, prevalent. So it's so I, I mentioned earlier some of the um, critiques that I could hear happening or concerns I could hear happening from a modernist perspective of, hey, wait, this doesn't sound like science. And now the postmodernist perspective that says, well, this sounds elitist and um, you're going to assess what a higher stage of development is. Um, <clears throat> Zach Stein, when he was on, spoke about how to actually understand development in an ecological um, and more complex way where someone might have been born into a rational worldview and be a psychopath or be an asshole, right? And someone might have been born into a mythic religious worldview, but trained on people like St. Francis and have really profound um, tolerance and compassion and et cetera. And so the idea, this is where you have to look at the multiple lines, the intersections between yes, you do. a million subparameters, because the idea that someone who has a rational cognitive worldview is going to be less problematic in the world than someone who has religious fundamentalist worldview is a pretty deep oversimplification. Absolutely. Uh, again, the whole point is, um, is certainly as far as is sort of the integral meta theory goes, um, hmm. is it's, it's, it's not just those two variables. It, it, it's literally uh, all of these variables. Um, and so if, if you're looking at somebody who's, you know, at a rational stage of development versus somebody that's at a, a mythic ethnocentric stage, um, it is true that if you're, correlating moral stages with those. And so you're looking at a moral stage coming from the rational altitude. And then you're looking at a moral stage coming from a mythic altitude. Then the moral stage at, at, the, at the rational altitude literally is post-conventional or universal or world-centric. So that, that literally is somebody who, if they're living from that stage morally, then they would not um, treat uh, other people unfairly. And the whole point about the universal moral stage of development is that all people are treated fairly regardless of race, color, sex, or creed. Whereas if you're at an ethnocentric mythic stage of development, then you're morally, you're invested in either a particular race or sex or creed or belief or nation. or uh, That's simply the nature of that stage of development. And so you can also, you can be at that stage um, and, and, and be a stage or two higher in, in the spiritual intelligence line. And so that would uh, give somebody um, a much uh, broader embrace of, of humanity. Um, but they, they could still get caught up in, in their ethnocentric prejudices because that's just the nature of what that stage does. Um, and then on top of all of that, toss in states and whether a person's had, you know, where their, their, their initial, um, what Dan Brown calls vantage point, what their vantage point is. Uh, and so all of those are, are coming into play. Um, and, and for postmodernism, uh, one of the striking things about that is that if you look at these stages of, of development and you look at the type of worldviews that they generate, um, it, it, it's, there's really an enormous amount of evidence that um, as we're tracking these stages in the cognitive line, let's say, and so you're going from a sensory motor type of intelligence to a, um, a simple conceptual pre-operational type of intelligence, then up to a concrete operational, conventional conformist uh, uh, mentality, and then up to formal operational or pure rationality. Um, and then the stage beyond that is, is, um, is a multiplistic type of cognition. So the worldviews uh, that are produced at these stages at the, at the mythic ethnocentric stage is what Graves call absolutistic because it really can't take a lot of other perspectives. So it just has its one ethnocentric view, and that's absolute truth. That's the word of God. That's the way it is. Um, and there are a lot of people in today's world that have a particular belief system that comes from that absolutistic level. And again, it can be belief systems that came from much higher levels. Uh, again, it can be Marxism or feminism or white supremacy. Uh, doesn't come from a very high level. Um, but but they, can, they can end up being absolutistic. And then you move up to rational, and, and Gray's called that multiplistic. 
because that takes multiple perspectives. Um, and then the stage right beyond that he called relativistic because it tends to, each stage transcends and includes its predecessor, just like molecules transcend and include atoms, cells transcend and include molecules. So um, each stage um, has uh, that uh, enveloping capacity. And another way to say that is it, it differentiates and then integrates, differentiates and then integrates. And what we find with the pluralist, the relativistic or pluralistic postmodern stage of development it, it is that it really is that relativistic stage that tends to have um, a structure that's extremely similar to a large number of the postmodern <clears throat> philosophies. And they really are relativistic in, in that particular sense. There is no uh, objective knowledge. It's all a social construction. Um, there is no one correct or higher culture. All cultures are equal. It's egalitarian. Um, and so this really is a multiculturalism. Um, and uh, the, the whole problem with that is on the one hand, you can see that what they're trying to do is they're still reacting to really ethnocentric movements. They don't want racist or sexist or misogynistic or homophobic or transphobic or on and on and on. But they, they've tended to take their own stance as an exception, um, and an exception they don't allow to anybody else. So according to that stage of the postmodern philosophy in general, there, there really is no such thing as, as any, anything like universal truth. Um, and they're very serious about that. Um, except they, and, and they give a whole series of reasons about how knowledge is created through um, uh, constructivism and contextualism and a perspectivalism so that every knowledge really is an interpretive uh, event. Therefore, there are no universal uh, truth claims. And then it maintains that every single one of those things that it said is universally true. And it's true for all people at all times and all cultures. It's not interpretation. It's absolute ultimate truth. And they maintain they have it and nobody else does. And that's the problem with postmodernism. It's got some terrifically important partial truths. And, and as postmodernism first began um, with early Foucault and Derrida and Lacan and, and those folks, they were, they were uh, showing us a lot of important, fairly novel discoveries about knowledge and its creation. Um, and there are partial truths that I think are important to, to um, incorporate. But as it went on, as, as unfortunately fairly often happens, it got more extreme and more extreme and more extreme. And, and, and it went just from, okay, all truth is contextual and situated to literally there, there is no truth. And hence we're in a post-truth, post-factual. This is a direct result of the postmodernists um, leaking out of the universities and, and into the culture at large. And it's funny to see Trump come along because he plays so fast and loose with the truth. And he, he seems to mimic some of the sort of conclusions that the postmodernists made. Um, in particular, the way he, he accuses the media of being fake news and uh, you know, that it's a post-truth world. Within about a month or two of his coming into office, um, on every university in, in, in every country on the planet, there, there is this deafening silence. And it was the postmodernists refusing to say there is no truth. They were so embarrassed by Donald Trump's use of the fact that there is no truth that they just, they saw the idiocy of it and they stopped using it. Um, even far leftist uh, organizations like the New York Times took out, paid millions of dollars for ads that said, truth is our profession. This is, uh, they would have never have, have dared to say that 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, so we're starting to see a, a sort of evolutionary correction in the wake of, of uh, uh, Donald Trump to all this kind of stuff. Well, it's interesting because we can look at um, postmodernism from the perspective that you shared of a certainty on the limits of certainty, right? right. Um, which was kind of an epistemological inquiry. We can look at the sociologic side of that science was kind of co-emerging with the industrial revolution and um, imperialism and colonialism. Yep. And then with the, the understanding of the bias 
the political bias in the social sciences being overextended into the physical sciences. But we can also recognize that uh, you get to a post-truth world from a game theoretic perspective when I can win by bluffing yeah. and when intentional disinformation that leads other sides to behave improperly is actually a really good strategy. And you right. run that on all sides with exponential information tech. Right. Take so much noise amplification that signal is no longer relevant. It's just what distortion bubble can we get everyone to believe in enough to win at a game? That's another kind of key insight. And that's obviously the one that Trump is coming from. It's not a deep epistemological insight. It's a poker player who knows how to, how to bluff well enough and how to create distortion yeah. bubbles. Yeah. And again, all of those are set in context of at least implicit truth. Mm -hmm. go forward. So, so um, to just kind of wrap up this, this piece that we've done so far on, you know, if we think about it in light of what is being explored at Neurohacker Collective, how can we uh, heal, integrate, upgrade human physiologic process and psychologic process at the individual level in relationship with the environment, you know, both interpersonally and, and um, objectively. It seems like the future hospital and the future monastery and the future school are the same place. Well, uh, if they're doing it right, they will be. Mm -hmm. um, Y'all have, uh, on, on the Neurohacker uh, website, you have a, a four-quadrant um, outline. Um, and, and you're explaining in terms of body care and environment care and mind care and relationship care, which is a terrific way to look at them. Um, and one of the things that people can do to start to take advantage of the types of things that integral approaches can offer. Um, the first thing is just a simple uh, knowledge about what's actually available. Because that's, that's what we find as, as we work with these, with these integral um, meta maps or, or meta models is like a, I've sort of been saying it throughout this whole conversation is how frequently even experts and authorities are just completely unaware of a large number of, of these areas. Um, or if they're there, they kind of, yeah, they sort of know that's there, but they don't take it seriously. They don't look into it. Um, and so for a lot of people, um, we've been talking about waking up, uh, for example, and, and the possibility of this thing called enlightenment or awakening. Um, many people still don't know anything about that. And, and the um, extraordinary um, value that that type of direct immediate experience uh, is claiming to contain. And for most people who have had um, any exposure to these types of practices, we definitely agree. Um, and, and that means, I mean, if you take somebody who's like working on uh, working with Zen Buddhism and is uh, right on the verge of having a Satori experience. Um, those that do, um, it's, it's like a, a, an extraordinary number of those who do, it's, it's well over 90%, um, maintain that this is the most real, most valid, most certain experience they've ever had. It, it, it's just nothing compares to it. Um, and that's a very, very common first person response to that, to that type of experience. And, and even though that's the case, um, and it certainly does not subjectively seem like an illusion at all. Um, but if it is an illusion, uh, you know, God bless it. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty wild illusion. Um, but most people still don't know anything about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so one of the things you can do by, by looking at, at the neurohacker site or, integral life site or destiny pranas, Zach's, any of these, um, is, is look at what's actually available to you in terms of your own potentials. And what you'll find is that number one, there are a lot more treasures than you suspect. They're, they're really extraordinary. And yet these are all available to you. If you decide you want to spend some time, um, lifting those weights to develop those muscles and there's it, it's a broad smorgasbord so not everybody wants to do everything 
And um, we have something called uh, integral transformative practice or integral life practice that works on the theory. And there's actually some, some research being done on this, which is astonishing. Um, but we call it uh, spiritual cross training. Um, studies have shown, for example, that people that do Vipassana and the people do Vipassana and weightlifting, mm-hmm. same amount of time, both groups. According to the judgments of the teachers, the students that are doing Vipassana and weightlifting are doing better in Vipassana. Right. Just do Vipassana. And now we've had studies that include almost a dozen different variables, all being trained at once. And it's staggering because all of them increase greater than any experiment done so far on using only one of them alone. So now this, uh, this just came out of Santa Cruz uh, mm-hmm. last summer, I think. Um, so uh, Mike Murphy and I, when we, when we were first developing integral transformative practice, we used to say, we have to be careful because we're going to give people metaphysical hernias um, because you, you can overdo it. There, there's a lot of stuff. Um, there's an enormous amount of potentials that human beings can do. And um, the belief, of course, mm-hmm. that as more and more people check these things out and because they're inherently intrinsically gratifying, that indeed, uh, as the future unfolds, then um, spiritual practice, medical practice, health practice, educational practice are going to start really um, impinging on each other. Uh, And if any one of them is going to be active, then the more effective they're going to be, the more they're interwoven with these other uh, dimensions. Um, And so that's what we are in the process of, of working out, to find out just what are the best combinations, what variables are really out there, um, what's the best way to put them together, and so on. And, and we're, we're right uh, on, the, on the door of that extraordinary um, research opportunity. It's, it's amazing, really. So I want everyone to really get a sense of what Ken is speaking to that is so profound. It's exactly what we are working to do some part of uh, advancing along with the work that the Integral Institute and places like this are doing is when you look at Vipassana meditation and weightlifting, having a virtuous cycle relationship, that's, that could actually be surprising. It could almost seem like those things should be dichotomous and, um, you know, take people in opposite directions, but there really is this process where a physiology that's more balanced has a neurophysiology that's more balanced has the hardware that is mediating conscious experience able to work better and vice versa, right? When someone is doing mindfulness practice, they get better at sports. Right. Um, and so, and yet what that doesn't say is that you look at someone like Ramana Maharshi, who clearly didn't seem to be suffering from his rheumatism, but it didn't cure his rheumatism either. And the most badass biohacker triathletes that have amazingly refined physiologies, they might have less depression and anxiety because their physiology is more balanced but it doesn't mean that they necessarily have a better insight into the nature of reality in any meaningful way. So the fact that you get synergies between the modalities doesn't mean that you can collapse one to the other. And so then we start looking at, okay, so if what's going on for one person's neurophysiology has to do with mold exposure and somebody else's head trauma and someone else's a gut brain access, it's not just like there's this thing called physical. We have to get into the sub ontologies of each of these domains and we don't want to just say okay as far as waking up everybody does vipassana so how do we do the right kind of assessments of what is going to be the most meaningful for each person psychologically spiritually physiologically relationally etc for where they're at now that will keep changing and what their goals are and the you know the integral psychograph that uh, ken and integral world developed was a starting point towards the deep nuanced kinds of um, assessments. And this is the work that Zach and Lectica has taken and et cetera, that can both customize education, customize psychotherapy, customize psychospiritual practice and medicine. And we're not that far from having the capacity to really be able to understand the individual radically deeper, synthesize knowledge from many domains and be able to customize not just all of that knowledge, but the synergies between those pieces of knowledge. And that, that I think really is the synthesis Holy grail that we're working towards. Yeah. And even, um, I mean, I I could just track my own, uh, 
involvement when I first started. Um, and I wrote uh, my first book uh, when I was 23. Um, it's called The Spectrum of Consciousness. Um, and it was looking at all the major forms of uh, psychotherapy mm. in East and West. Um, and I was pretty convinced that all of them had something to offer. Um, but it wasn't really clear why there were so, so many of them, and they all kind of differed from each other. And they often reached opposite conclusions. So uh, psychoanalysis said you have to strengthen your ego, and Zen Buddhism said you have to get rid of it back then. We had no idea how those things fit together, um, how they related. And, and, and that was just the dimension of, of therapy on the interior upper left quadrant. Um, but where we've come from almost 50 years ago to where we are today, it is, it's getting very, very close to exactly what you were talking about. And we can already do a fair amount of it. That's what's so astonishing. And certainly a lot of the big chunks, um, we have, we have a, a, a pretty high probability that they're, they're there, they're important, and they can be included in ways that we're starting to understand. Um, so it, it really is, um, it, it's, it's a, a period of, of cautious optimism for this type of growth and development. It's, it's really great. So, so we're all, uh, society's going to become um, a neurohacking collective at, at some point. And that will be very, very cool time. So just as a last treat to leave everybody here with, we're going to put in the show notes this link to this YouTube video from, I don't know, 20-something years ago yeah. of Ken doing yeah. this, um, this EEG meditation demonstration. Um, we've had people on the show like Dr. Andrew Hill from UCLA, who's one of the top neurofeedback practitioners in the world and on the topic of neurofeedback. Right. But Ken wasn't actually doing neurofeedback there. I'm, I'm sure neurofeedback was part of the meditation training, but he was just doing a meditation technique and showing what was happening with brain waves. And that different meditation techniques had different brainwave signatures. It right. was a high delta. There was a high alpha theta. Right. And then there was this really strange, very little brainwave activity anyway. Right. Now, we didn't have gamma and lambda on there. We didn't have lots of leads. But it's still something really, I mean, at minimum, a fun parlor trick to watch. But um, beyond yeah. that, something really philosophically interesting is happening. Um, would you just speak a little bit to how someone would go about how someone might interpret what's happening in that video. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, it, it's an early, a very simplified, um, in a sense, version of a kind of, uh, EEG machine. Um, it was developed by, I think, um, a gentleman named, hmm. uh, Maxwell Cade. Um, and his, uh, I, uh, I actually talked to his primary, uh, associate, um, a woman who was, uh, sort of running, running the foundation at that time. Um, and what it shows is uh, very simplified. It, it's got about 16 channels. It has left hemisphere and right hemisphere. And then it has uh, hmm. theta, alpha, theta, and delta waves. Particular video shot that happens to be uh, on the web um, is I had actually just gotten this machine and I just put it together. Uh, and so by the time I get it up and running and I just pointed a video camera at the, at the screen, so you could see what it was doing and then you can see me. And what you see is because I was just doing a lot of, you know, analytic thinking stuff, you can see uh, an enormous amount of activity in, on the upper left hemisphere and not very much in the right hemisphere and not very much in, in, uh, alpha or theta. Um, and yet delta is, is maximum. Um, and that was always interesting. Um, and one of the reasons that I talked to um, uh, Maxwell Cade's um, uh, collaborator was I wanted to make sure I was using the machine correctly. Uh, and I had sen you know, the sensitivity right and all that because I didn't want it to be you know, some artifact of the machine or anything like that. And so we walked through it on several <clears> occasions, <throat> and she was convinced <throat> that uh, it was working correctly. And, that this and most neurophysiologists and what would I jump did, straight to brain tumor. Huh? Most neurophysiologists would jump straight to brain tumor. Well, I, I understand. Um, the, the initial simplified, not necessarily correct, uh, Interpretations that delta waves occur often in, in uh, deep dreamless sleep, and and they're equated by the traditions mm. with, um, deep 
dreamless sleep is a causal state. So it's a sort of a pure, uh, deep, dreamless, formless, spiritual state. Um, and all I was trying to do um, was go into a type of meditation uh, that I developed over the years, which really is a kind of suspension of, of activity. And the way it feels is that I'm just really relaxing the brain. I mean, that's what it actually just feels like. And so what you see on the screen, and I lie down and I sort of say to the video, okay, I'm going to try it now and see what happens. And so I lie down. And all of the lights are sort of lit up, you know, across the screen. And then I light and I go into the state and one by one, every single light goes to zero, just all the way down the screen. It's sort of shocking, actually. It looks like I'm brain dead, except the, the two delta are still maximum. Um, and so that's not even a common meditative state um, that I do. It's just, it's just one that I had learned how to do after decades of, uh, of meditation. Um, and it's a type of neurode or a type of cessation uh, experience. Um, and the sensitivity is, is set at highest sensitivity. Um, so it, it's, it's apparently not an artifact of the machine. But people should understand that just because all these slides go to zero, it doesn't mean that my brain actually isn't functioning. It just means the machine can't detect it, that the activities are clearly quite lowered. Um, and, and across uh, a lot of areas, neurophysiologically neurophysiolo uh, would, would sort of technically probably be said, uh, it just isn't something that's possible. Um, but you can, you can watch it and, and decide. I, probably about half the people that have seen it think I, I uh, doctored it somehow. Um, but I didn't. This is straight out of the box, first time I ever used it. And you can look at it and see what you think. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I, I think it is as intriguing a impetus to start a meditation practice as any 10 minute video on YouTube. If someone hasn't uh, already started. Well, that's a good, that's a good, uh, uh, excuse to have it up then. Um, in terms of people being able to go deeper into both integral philosophy and integral life practice, I would say, uh, brief history of everything is still a great introduction to philosophy. And would you say Integral Life Practice, that book, is a good one for people that are wanting to look at the practical side? That'll work fine. There's a simplified, almost kind of picture book called The Integral Vision. Mm -hmm. uh, and that goes over um, things fairly well. Um, and um, the, the recent edition of Brief History of Everything has an afterword. Um, that was done, um, a conversation between me and Lana Wachowski, the mm. writer of the Matrix uh, movies, um, who found myself a long time ago, and, and we've become uh, really good friends. It's a fast, fascinating conversation, uh, so people can uh, enjoy, enjoy that. And in terms of uh, just your current thinking on different topics, KenWilber.com is the best place where people can stay up to date. Um, we're yeah we're yes and no um uh i haven't actually kept that up to date we're going back and and um um updating it uh so probably the um website that has the most amount of material including weekly uh dialogues uh between me and and uh various individuals on these types of topics is just integrallife.com great so we'll put all those links in the show notes and um I look forward to hear any particular uh, thoughts and questions that the uh, audience has on areas that we might want to go deeper in the future. Again, this was a really, uh, this was a delight and an honor to have you with us uh, and to have my you. My pleasure, my friend. Appreciate how much you've done to lay the foundation of the field that we can Great. Uh, keep exploring. And so thank you so much. Yeah. This podcast is for informational purposes only. The podcast is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. You should not use the information on the podcast for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease or prescribing any medication or other treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider before taking any medication or nutritional, herbal, or homeopathic supplement, and with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. 
Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this or any other podcast. Reliance on the podcast is solely at your own risk. Information provided on the podcast does not create a doctor-patient relationship between you and any of the health professionals affiliated with our podcast. Information and statements regarding dietary supplements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to therein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician. This podcast is owned by Neurohacker Collective.